in your worship. Yeah, don't, don't just wait for something to happen. Make something happen. And I just find the more I open my arms and my heart to God, the more He reveals something to me. Even this morning, as, as I think Josie or Tracy were leading us, there's that song where everything, everything I am is yours. And I just, again, rededicated my life. I said, everything, God, everything, God, is yours. And uh, as, we, as we come to the end of this 21 day of prayer and fasting, and, and if you're visiting with us, uh, just jump on board with us today. But uh, I know many of you have been praying and fasting. And as we do that today, uh, right across all the centres, across uh, Melbourne and Jakarta and Surabaya and Bangkok and Singapore and now Birmingham, because we're behind in hours, the best till last, amen? Uh, this is a dedication service. It's a chance for us to uh, celebrate what God's spoken to us over the last 21 days, but also uh, to dedicate ourselves again to encounter God, to experience life, to impact the world, and just to say, God, my life, everything I am belongs to you. And 2024 is going to be a year where we see breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. Amen. We're going to walk in the victory that Jesus has for us. And so, uh, so that's what we want to do over the next few moments. I'm going to share from the scripture, and then uh, we're, going to, we're going to worship and have a chance to dedicate our lives to God again, and then we'll go out and have some soup and bread. Amen? Amen. So we break our fast today, and, um, and uh, I just want to also just uh, echo Pastor Tracy's words. Thank all the people that have been involved this week in everything the church has done. It's been absolutely amazing. The Samaritan's Purse, the prayer, the prayer mornings have been incredible with people joining on Zoom and here in person. Tracy and I had the privilege on Wednesday to be down in Parliament House, suited and booted. And uh, there were, we were part of the Open Doors um, launch of their World Watch List, which, where they, uh, they rank the top 50 countries where persecution is at its highest. And hearing some of the stories was just, um, yeah, heartbreaking, to be honest. And, uh, but one of, the, one of the speakers from West Africa, who, uh, who just has experienced so much persecution, they brought him over. And there were 93 MPs in the room as he pleaded with them. He said, government, UK government, will you not just help us financially? We're not looking for that. We're looking for your moral courage. Come on. And so it was a privilege to be in that room on Wednesday. I also had the privilege to... Uh, uh, speak at the launch of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association on Tuesday at the NEC for a big event coming up uh, in June and just to be able to speak at that was awesome. So God is using Trinity Birmingham to impact the world, amen? Come on, you can get excited about your church. It's an awesome church. So uh, well done to everyone that has fasted in some way and I want to encourage you, fasting is one of the three disciplines that Jesus speaks about. He talks about in Matthew 6, he challenges us and speaks to us about how to pray, how to give, and how to fast. So these are three disciplines that we should live in and grow in continually. And I know for some of you, uh, you've, already, you've already said that you are going to continue on uh, praying and fasting once this is over. Jesus said, when you fast, not if, not, not just for 21 days, but when you fast, and I want to encourage you to keep this discipline going. And, and there's just some things that can't be broken without prayer and fasting. Uh, there was a time where Jesus uh, was up, up the mountain spending time with God, his father, and the disciples were down the bottom of the mountain. And a man who had a son who, who, had, a, who, who was, had a spirit in him that wanted, kept throwing him on the fire and wanting to kill and destroy him, he, he carries his son to the disciples and he says, can you help me? Can you cast this evil spirit out? Can you set my son free? Please, I'm a desperate father and, and, and nothing has worked. And the disciples pray, but nothing happens. Jesus comes down the mountain. The disciples go to Jesus. Jesus, we couldn't do it, but, but would you do it? And Jesus, one touch, one touch of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, all power, all authority that dwelt through him. One touch set that boy free from that day forward. Come on, someone praise Jesus for his power. The disciples gather later on, they have a bit of a debrief. And they say, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said this, because there's some things that can only be broken through prayer 
and fasting. And so I want to encourage you, there are some things in your life, if there is something where you just keep coming back to the same point, you're not quite getting that breakthrough, it's probably because you're just doing the same things over and over again. Maybe you're more spiritual than me, but that's what happens in my life. I think, why isn't there a breakthrough happening? It's because I haven't really changed anything I was doing. But that's the power of fasting. When you bring this spiritual gift and discipline into your life, there's breakthrough and change. Amen? And that's what I believe we've seen over the last 21 days. Here's some testimonies. Pastor Simon sent out a link for some of you to feedback on how this time has impacted you. So I just want to read some of them here. This time of prayer and fasting has been like a spiritual reboot. I like that. Being able to, I don't know who these are from, by the way. Uh, Being able to spend time clearing out all the clutter of my life and make space for God. It's helped me focus on my relationship with the Lord and not on my stomach. Definitely been a challenge for the food wise, but also rewarding. I will most certainly make prayer and fasting a regular discipline in my life. Praise the Lord. During our time of prayer and fasting, I think I know who this is. During our time of prayer and fasting, we had one, one big request in mind. Within six days, God answered our prayer in being able to get married at Trinity by the church being granted its married license. <laughs> Kelly, could that have been you? <laughs> uh, a couple of others. It was great spending time reading our prayer and fasting booklet together. With our busy lives, it was ble- we were so blessed to have quality time reading together and making our stronger unit. Just want to give thanks to and praise to God for being there for us and blessing us during our 21-day prayer and fasting. During our prayer and fasting period, I learned not to fixate on what I wish God was doing in my life or has already done, but on what He is doing because He's the author and the finisher of my faith. I choose to fix my eyes on Jesus alone. Isn't that awesome? Uh, Someone else here, this prayer and fasting season has been so good. God has answered my prayers and I want to thank Him for that. And then finally this one. This 21 days prayer and fasting has helped me to become more conscious of the power and the presence of God in my life. How beautiful is that? I feel more emboldened in my spirit knowing that there uh, there has been a real shift. I know that God is showing me and preparing me and equipping me for the work that He's called me to. In the times when I feel hungry, I no longer focus on my own hunger. I think and pray of those who are without food or other basic things that I take for granted. And I ask God to show me how I can help. I am now planning to make fasting and prayer a regular part of my weekly routine. Amen. Come on, let's thank God for what He's done in us uh, and and in so many people. So, And that's really the heartbeat of why we started this, this time. It's to... It's for us to draw closer to God because He wants to draw close to us and He wants you to know Him in such a personal, real way. And I don't know where you're at with your relationship with God today, but I want you to know that He loves you, He knows you, He made you, and He wants you to know Him because He has so much to reveal in your life about Him and about you and about what He's got for you. Amen? So today what I want to do for the for the time we have, is to look at uh, the time in the Bible where Jesus fasted and just look at some of the, ex- the lessons we can learn from His example of when Jesus fasted. And I want to look at that. It's in Matthew chapter 4. But, but more importantly than just learn some lessons of how Jesus fasted and what, what, what He did through that time, what I really sense the Holy Spirit pressing on today is what happened at the end of Jesus' fast. Because at the end of his fast, just like we're at the end of our 21 days, he didn't just go back to what he was doing before. He Before his prayer and fasting in Matthew chapter 4, he'd just been baptized in Matthew 3, and now we're going to see that he prays and fasts for 40 days. But then at the end of that period, after his baptism, after that time of prayer and fasting, then he's released into ministry. He didn't preach, he didn't do any ministry until he was baptized and then he went through this 40-day prayer and fasting. Then he started preaching the gospel, then he started preaching the good news that the kingdom now is here and he drew the disciples and called the disciples. So what I sense prophetically is today is not just the end of a 21-day fast, 
I don't want you to relapse into who you were or what you were doing before, but I want you to be released into the ministry that the Holy Spirit has for you this year. Three people are excited about that word from the Lord. Some of you are thinking, oh, I don't want to relapse. I get it. I get it. Man, I, my, you know what my weakness is? Panna raisins, the pastries. Anyone ever have those? Oh, the French, oh, anyway, yeah, 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 I see that hand. You feel my pain. They're my weakness. In fact, at Morrison's on Friday night, they were right there at the cash register. It's like, how dare they put, and it even was the cheaper ones. <gasps> but I said, no, get behind me, Panna Raisin. <laughs> but whatever, don't relapse, but be released. And I'm going to just share some thoughts with you, and then I'm going to open up the front here, and I want you to come forward and, and step into the release that the Holy Spirit has for you this year. Amen? So at the 21 days, it's not the end of, yes, it might be the end of our prayer and fasting, but it's the beginning of God releasing something fresh in you. Because we see that in Jesus. When he finished his 40 days of prayer and fasting, he was then released into fulfilling becoming the Messiah, the Savior, death on the cross, the purposes God had for him, coming back to life, and now he is alive. Amen? So we're going to see a release, a release of new ministry, a release of new encounter, a release of new revelation, a release of new Holy Spirit power, a release of new impact, a release of new intimacy with God. Amen? So Matthew chapter 4, if you have your Bible, you can open it on your devices Anyone got a paper version? Anyone got their paper Bibles with them? Yes. But however you read it, Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to read from the NIV version this morning. Matthew chapter 4. When you've got it, say, got it? Matthew chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't just do 21, he did 40. Wow. It says that he was hungry. It's quite obvious, isn't it? Anyone hungry today? I'm a little bit hungry. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The NLT version actually says he was very hungry. He, they obviously wanted to make an emphasis of just how hungry he was. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Amen. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. Come on, church. Come on, church. Hey, the devil can read the Bible too. How much more should you make sure you're reading the Bible every single day? Because the devil knows it. He just can't create it. There's only one creator of the word, and that was the word that was made flesh. That was the word before, was the beginning, was the word. The word was with God. He is the word. He's the creator of the word. But the devil can read the word, and he says, because it's written. This is all in Deuteronomy. He will, this is Psalm 91, he quotes. He will command his angels concerning you. They'll lift, up, they'll lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil came to him and took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And this, uh, and, he sa- and he said, all the kingdoms, he says, I will give you this. All of this I can give you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. I'm going to go, boo. Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written. Worship the Lord God and serve Him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. This message really stirred in my spirit uh, when on day eight of our prayer journal that we've been doing. And day eight was, uh, uh, the, the title for that day was Travailing in God's Purpose. And the author wrote this, If he being the Son of God would humble himself to resist food, subject himself to hunger and persist in seeking God in prayer, shouldn't we? (laughs) And and it was, I mean, there was a few days of of the journal that really ministered to me, but this one really stirred something up as I personally wanted to press into a deeper power of God in my life and encountering his presence and also 
being someone that he can use in the world. And so what can we learn from Jesus? A few things really quickly I want to just share with us. The first thing is, and I want you to repeat it after me, I am spirit-led. I am spirit-led. I am led by the Spirit. The first thing we notice here is it was actually the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness. It was actually the Holy Spirit that led him into this fasting and this encounter. I want to encourage you today that there has to be a spiritual breakthrough in your life first before in the natural. And so in any area of your life, be led by the Spirit because the Spirit, you have to have a breakthrough in the Spirit first. You might say, well, hang on. I thought the Holy Spirit's just nice and warm and fuzzy. And He just leads me to comfortable places and an easy life. No, no, no. If you truly are going to say, God, my life belongs to you, and I want to step into all that you have for me, guess what? It's going to get tested. And that's what was happening here. Jesus was going to face some tests. Yes, he was the son of God, but he was also fully man. His stomach would have rumbled just like yours and mine. And so he faced some tests, the test to overcome. And for you and I this year, I want to encourage you, don't pull back from the test, but say, God, I'm stepping up for you and bring on the tests. Because we know that James says when tests and trials come, they actually just increase our perseverance and then perseverance completes its work in us so that we can be fully complete. There is a spiritual breakthrough that you've got to go through and you can't, your, your husband can't do it for you, your wife can't do it for you, I can't do it for you, you've got to win the battles. Every single one of you will have spiritual tests where you've got to break through first in the Spirit. But I, I want to encourage the church, do it. Because on the other side is a release into the ministry that God's got for you. Amen. And so we see here that Jesus was Spirit-led. He was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Matthew Henry, the great uh, theologian, he says this, There's no conquest without a combat. We know that we don't fight against flesh and blood. Ephesians teaches us that there's powers and principalities, there's a spiritual realm going on, and that's why we have to win in the Spirit first. And that's the power of prayer and fasting. You win the battle in the Spirit first, then the physical breakthroughs happen. Amen? We see in Genesis where Jacob wrestles for his blessing. There's a moment where an angel comes and he's physically wrestling. And the angel says, hey, let me go. But Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. There is a spiritual wrestle we have to go through if we're going to break through to the other side of all that God has for us. So let's be spirit-led. Let's make sure in this 21-day prayer and fasting, what we did, we put food aside, we put our flesh aside so that our spirit can commune with God in a deeper way. And I want to encourage you, keep pursuing that, keep hungering after Him and not just, not just see it as 21 days, but say, God, I want to break through in the Spirit more and more. Amen? Say, I am led by the Spirit. The second thing we see is, I belong to God. Say, I belong to God. So we see that Jesus is having these temptations come at Him and uh, belonging is so important. As a human being, we all want to belong. I'm sure if you can reflect over a time in your life where you have been in a group of people or a place where you just knew you did not belong. Can you think about that right now? Where you're just going, I just don't belong here. But I'm sure you can think of a time too where you've come into a group of people or a place where you go, ah, this is where I belong. And I want to I prophesy and declare and affirm over you today, you belong to God and you belong in this place. Every single one of you. Amen? Yes? Yes. Come on, talk back to me, church. The more you talk, the faster I preach. <laughs> Verse 3 and 6. The tempter comes and he says, he says, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Now, answer me back. Is he the Son of God? Absolutely, he's the Son of God. Was Jesus, do you think, confused about who he was? 
Do you think Jesus was a bit confused about his purpose and plan that God had for him before time and his time was now to come? Do you think there was any lack of clarity about who Jesus was, where he'd come from, where he was going and what he was called to do? Absolutely none. See, here's what I want you to learn. The devil has no power over you. Because Jesus' death and resurrection, he has disarmed the enemy. You are living in victory 24-7. Somebody get excited about that today. He doesn't have any power over you. But all he can do is get you to doubt, get discouraged, and get distracted. That's his only tools, that's his only arsenal he's got in his weaponry. Because he knows if you win the battle in the spirit, if you break through and know whose you belong to, then there is nothing stopping you on this planet and eternity. Amen? But all he can do, if, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're a Christian, if, if, you, if God loves you, oh, if he's going to take care of you, if he'll provide for you, you know, if... That's all he can do. And as soon as he's got you doubting, he's got you. Because as soon as doubt comes in, doubt's the opposite of faith. Whereas faith brings the breakthrough, doubt brings the step back. Come on, church, are you with me? Say, I belong to God. You've got to be absolutely convinced in your heart that when the enemy comes and says, if, 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 you go, I am a child of God. Jesus, save me from my sins. I am forgiven. I am set free. I am a saint. I, have, I am seated in heavenly realms. I am filled with his power. I am loved. I am forgiven. I am his child. Nothing will separate from me from his love. I belong to God. And when the enemy comes, you say, talk to the hand, buddy. Do you know whose I am? Do you know whose I am? You want to get to me, you got to get through him first. And guess what? You're already defeated. Come on. He's under the feet of Jesus. All authority on heaven and earth is his. Come on, church. I want you to rise up in the authority that Jesus has already given you. And walk in it. Amen. Say, I belong to God. The third thing, I rely on God. Say, I rely on God. I am led by the Spirit. I belong to God and I rely on God. So the tempter continues. He says after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. What we need to learn here is the, the tempter will only look at the area of your weakness. And this is why we need to be on guard and alert that's why 1 Peter 5.8 says this amazing scripture where it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But he, can only, he, will, he will only try and get you at your weakness. Ah, Jesus is hungry. Let's tempt him with bread. Let's get him there. But for all of us, we're going to have different areas of our lives that are... We have weakness or, or temptations in, but I want to encourage you, church, be alert today. Be sober-minded, be sensitive. That's what fasting do does. It gives you a spiritual sharpness and a sensitivity to, to hear the Word and understand what's happening in the spiritual realm. And so as we, as we go about our time, we go, okay, God, help me here because I'm aware that this is an area I need, I need strength in. And so the enemy comes and he says, hey, turn these stones into bread. And really what this is saying is, Jesus, are you going to rely on God as your source of sustenance and life? Or are you going to turn the stones into bread? Because could he have turned the stones into bread? Absolutely, he could have. But this was really about who do you rely on? And of course, we know Jesus' response. Jesus says, it is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's why your time alone with God and reading your Bible is so important. Because then you learn the words of God. You learn the word of truth, the word of instruction, the words that, of life, the words that set you free. And then you live on those words. 
And that's what sustains your spirit. That's what gives you life. That's what you desire. That's what you get pleasure in. That's what fills you with hope. That's all you need. And Jesus came to this place where he said, you know what? You can tempt me with that devil, but I don't need that bread because I rely on God. And every word that comes out of his mouth is all I need. God and his word is enough. Come on, church. Come on. His word is enough. And as I've already said, he is the word that was made flesh. He's the light to our path. And we rely on God and his word alone. We depend on him. He's our sustenance. He's our satisfaction. He is our pleasure. And that's what I've loved about this 21 days. I've fallen more in love with God because I've spent more time with him. I've set things aside that have allowed me just to spend more time on God and say, God, I don't need anything else. I rely on you and you alone. Amen. Say, I rely on God. The fourth thing, I trust God to take care of me. Come on, say it nice and loud. I trust God to take care of me. So we see the next temptation comes. The devil took him up to a holy city. He had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And so this test and temptation comes for Jesus to really say, Jesus, do you believe that God the Father is going to take care of you? Now, Jesus would have known this because he knew his plan to come and die on the cross. And he knew and had to trust that God the Father at the appointed time would raise him back to life. And aren't you glad this morning that God the Father had the power and did raise Jesus back to life? Amen. But he, he would have had to have trusted, but he knew this wasn't the time. This wasn't the time to lay his life down. That time would come, but it wasn't the appointed time. And so for Jesus, the temptation here was to truly come to that place of again surrendering to the Father and saying, I trust that you're going to take care of me. And today, for some of you, that wrestle might be true. God, are you truly going to take care of me? I want, to, I want you to be convinced today and by the power of the Holy Spirit when we pray in a moment to receive by the Spirit that conviction that says God is going to take care of me. And just like we read in Exodus 19 verse 4, it says, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings. And in Psalm 61 verse 4, it says, I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of of your wings. There is safety in God. There is protection in God. He is a strong refuge and He is all powerful and almighty and He will take care of you. Jesus answers again, He says, It's all also written, do not put the Lord God to the test. You don't have to test God, you just need to know that God will take care of you. Amen. So someone say, God will take care of me. And then the fifth one is, I worship God. Say that, I worship God. And this is where kind of, we're, we're coming to the climax of the, the, the moment here with Jesus, the final temptation, and now the tempter is really going for the jugular. He's putting all his cards on the table. If it was a football game, he's sending the goalkeeper right up into the attack. This is, this is it. This is where he really wants to get Jesus. And so it says, The devil took him to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he says, All of this can be yours. Look at all of this. I want to give it to you. You can have it all. The crazy thing is, Jesus was there before the world was even created. I want to ask, what was he actually going to show him that Jesus didn't already create? But anyway, that's just a side thought. So he takes him to this high man. All of this could be yours. I can offer you everything if you just sign here, 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 and give, my soul, give your soul away. He says, I can offer you everything, everything, if you bow down and worship me. This is why worship is such a battle. Worship is such a battle. Remember that this, this person who's doing the tempting 
way before he was Lucifer in charge of the worship in heaven. But instead of giving the glory to God and the worship to God, all of a sudden he wanted a little bit of the worship. He thought, oh, I want a bit of this glory stuff. Instead of giving it to God, I, and that's why he was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels who are now demons. So there's always a battle for worship, not just in the church, but in your heart too. There's a battle for worship. And that's why I started off by saying, I encourage you, come into the service and just go. Because there's a battle for worship. You break through in worship, you break through in the spirit. Come on, somebody. Come on. This is really where the rubber hits the road. And in a moment, we're going to pray. And the challenge for all of us to give everything to worship Jesus this year. I don't know what's happened in the past, in your years before, but this year can be absolutely transformative if you say, I worship God and God alone. No one else, nothing else, but God alone. Amen. Jesus challenges us. He says, you can't have two masters. You can't, you can't serve one or two or three or four different things. You, you either love one and hate one. You either despise one or you are devoted to one. You can't serve two things. And this is the challenge for all of us. Because guess what? There's lots of things we can worship or give our time to, isn't there? But actually the challenge is, come on. The challenge, the tempter saying, will you worship me? The other thing he's trying to do too, he's trying to shortcut the cross. He's trying to shortcut the pain. He's going, hey, Jesus, forget the nails, forget the pain, forget the death. You don't need to go through all that. The whippings, the ridicule, the humiliation, the crown of thorns, you can skip it all. I can give you the reward now. Get rich quick now. He's saying, hey, just skip. See, here's the thing about Christianity. You can't, you can't shortcut the suffering. You can't shortcut the cross. Every single one of us are called to take up our cross daily and follow him. If you're looking for an easy ride, Christianity is not the religion for you. It requires you to die to self. But what did Jesus say? If we lose ourself, we find life. When we lay down our life, we actually find life, life eternal, life to the full in Jesus. But he's looking for that. He's looking for that absolute worship, laying our lives down to him. This 21 days has been about putting him first, adoring him first, about saying, Jesus, you're more important than anything else in my life. You're definitely more than the Panoraisins. You're more important than anything. Here's what I wrote on my, in my journal on day eight that I really felt the Holy Spirit minister to me. I said, wow, the enemy wants our worship. He wants my worship. There's a battle for lordship and worship over my life. The devil wants it. And just like he said to Jesus, I can give you everything if you just bow down and worship me. This is such a lie. Worship the devil, you die. <laughs> worship God, you live. And so the choice is the same I have today. I must choose who I worship. Through prayer and fasting, I can grow closer to you, Lord, and make you Lord of my life and turn away from temptation. Jesus, you began your ministry on the back of this battle, and now you're ready. And so out of these times of prayer and fasting, will there be a breakthrough of a new season of ministry release in my life? Amen. There's a battle for worship, church. And I want to say to some of you today, don't get sucked into his lies. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all counterfeit. He promised Jesus that he'd give it to him. But guess what? It wasn't his to give. The earth belongs to the Lord. He only promises empty promises. And don't get sucked into the promises of this world. Don't fall in love with the things of this world because they are empty and they will lead you down a path that is not life. And I want to encourage you, some of you have perhaps have been just getting into things or delving into things that have distracted you from true worship of God. But I want to say to you today, it's not true, it's all lies. Watch out for the smoke and mirrors. He promises the world, but he delivers hell.
He can only lie, steal and kill and destroy. He is empty promises, but worship the Lord God only. And that's what Jesus says. Jesus turns around and he says, Get away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Come on. Then at this place, the devil left him alone and the angels came and attended him. Worship the Lord God only. The reality is, I'm sure for some of us, we face some battles during this 21 days, temptations and troubles and trials, I'm sure. But as you have come through, as you have remained steadfast, as as you've said, I will worship the Lord God alone, then all of a sudden, guess what? The devil has no power over you. (laughs) He has no opportunity to convince you, distract you, discourage you, or get you to turn away. And I want to believe that in Trinity, Birmingham, there's a group of people where the devil's coming and he's going, you know what, don't bother. Don't bother. Because guess what? They worship the Lord God passionately. They love God above all things. I've tried everything. I've tried food. I've tried money. I've tried Netflix. I've tried, I've tried everything. But guess what? I can't sway them. I can't move them because they rely on God. They trust in God. They worship God. Come on. This is a waste of my time. I'm out of here. Come on. That's the spirit. Why don't you stand with me and I'm going to invite the worship team back. And we're just going to take a moment to worship and rededicate our lives again. Just like Jesus came through his prayer and fasting to a place where it released him into ministry. I believe for your life, every single one in this room today, there is a release coming over your life. There's a release coming over your life. As we come to the end of the 21 days, there's a release into ministry. Amen. We're going to, I'm going to just ask the team to just sing that song again. Let's declare the name of Jesus. Declare the name of Jesus. And as we do that, if you're saying, Jesus, Jesus, this year is going to be different to any other year. This year, I want to put my trust, my whole trust in you. I want to worship you with all my heart. Today is the day we're breakthrough. I want to invite you to come out of your seat. And we're going to believe for the Holy Spirit to break through, particularly over doubt. This is what I sense in the Spirit today. Doubt has had a hold over you too long, but today doubt gets dealt with right here at the altar. And you can leave this place with such a conviction of faith that it transforms the way you think, the way you speak, the way you live. Doubt, its hold on you is broken in the name of Jesus Christ. But if any of those areas, reliance on God, trusting in God to take care of you, your health, protection, whatever area that you need to surrender to God, but particularly worship, then come on, step out of your seat and allow the Holy Spirit, full control, full control to release you in a new era of ministry this year.